For almost three years, the stage hit his delighted millions. On Broadway, in Chicago, from Boston to San Francisco, in Vienna, Buenos Aires, Tokyo, and Copenhagen. And now, with the same engaging characters, the same hilarious situations, the same provocative lines, the moon is blue has at last hit the screen. You must be out of your mind. You can't bring a bear to see a movie. Why not? He loved the play. <laughs> Ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen, joined again by the radiant Samantha Ellis. Smith, are you back? Hello, hello. Yes, I'm very glad to be back. I'm bummed I could not discuss Lena, but we are back to discuss... Some other interesting women and men. The Lena episode was very sad that you weren't there because I know you're a big fan, but it did turn out really well. And if you haven't listened to it, you should. This week, we are going from talking about Lena Horne to the salacious crumbling of the production code, starting with 1953's The Moon is Blue. We don't have a guest, just us this week, because you know what? The movie's sexiness stands on its own and we don't need extra gilding of the lily. Before we get to that, we want to talk briefly about our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. We do all sorts of additional bonus content, including double features, looking at remakes, and based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. If you are on there, you probably found out that Katherine Hepburn won our March Madness bracket, which we are already thinking of ideas for next March Madness. You will also only be able to listen to our TCM Film Festival Audio, a near two-hour episode of just TCM intros, including the fabulous conversation with Russ Tamblin, recorded by our very own Samantha Ellis. We have all sorts of other amazing intros, including from Opening Night, the conversation with Paul Thomas Anderson and Steven Spielberg, the Frankie Avalon intro, and Margaret's introduction to Bye Bye Birdie. It will all be on there on Patreon until it drops on the main feed at a later date. So if you want to listen to it, head over to our Patreon. We also give out regular care packages of movies, gifts, tote bags, and let you guess on an episode. It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget my book, but have you read the book? 52 Literary Gems and Inspired Our Favorite Movies is out now. You can order that wherever you get books. If you're interested in a signed copy, drop me an email or a tweet or go to our Patreon and send a message. I am still sending out signed copies to people that want them. And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art all designed by Samantha Ellis, including our amazing Makoko mugs and our starring Jimmy Stewart as Buttons the Clown. We also hope to have more artwork from some other amazing people that have volunteered to make stuff for us. That is all at redbubble.com slash people slash ticklish biz. Now, let's talk about The Moon is Blue. This film's from 1953. Directed by everybody's favorite curmudgeon, Otto Preminger. Reminder, he was not a nice person. Stars Bill Holden as Donald Gresham, an architect who decides to lovingly sexually harass a woman. I'm going to have to throw this out here. I know we only look at movies from the lens in which they are made, but it's also something where we balance it from the lens of contemporary times. This movie has a lot of things that we go back and forth on. Don Gresham, though, meets... The beautiful Patty O'Neill, played by Maggie McNamara, while walking down the street one day, follows her up to the Empire State Building. What starts as a simple attempt to get her to go to his apartment turns into far more, with his ex-girlfriend's father, played by David Niven, showing up, and a lot of saucy talk about sex that was frowned upon at the time. I remember discovering this through Kirby Dick's documentary, This Film Is Not Yet Rated, which looked at the rating system and the fact that the Hollywood production code was ridiculously anti-Semitic and sexist and homophobic, all sorts of ists. But it talked about this film as the beginning of the end for the production code. And that's how I saw it. How did you see it? You know, it's so crazy. I really can't put my finger on when I actually saw this movie for the first time, but I know it was quite a long time ago. I was a William Holden fan from pretty much the near beginning. So I think maybe it was just my love of William Holden that led me to this film or just its historical significance. 
It's so surprising that not a lot of people talk about it, though. And that's definitely why I wanted us to bring some attention to it. The first time that I watched it so long ago and thinking about what I retained from it going into the second watch. Oh, they're just all talking about taking her virginity and it's so creepy and this movie didn't age well at all. Then I watched it a second time and I, everything's flipped and it's actually aged pretty well. And it's quite a funny, honest movie. And I don't think it really gets enough credit for that. It really doesn't get a lot of appreciation. I also think it's had a very small release. Most people see it through rare TCM showings. It's just not a movie that gets restored a lot and is presented as this really important piece of history that it is in terms of film history. I wanted to bring Kirby Dick on the podcast, but he politely declined and said that he did not know nearly enough about the rating system at the time, which is fine. His documentary is fantastic. I heartily recommend it. If you're looking for an overview of how the production code segued into the motion picture code, which still has a lot of problems. But to watch this movie now, yeah, I joke about the fact that Don is incredibly intense in his pursuit of Patty, hiding buttons so that she'll have to go down to his office and then trying to find a way to get her into his apartment. This is any other genre of film or modern day. You have to tread really really nimbly to make it look not creepy and weird that his intent is to try to sleep with her. From there, it just turns into the wacky comedy of manners. If you really watch this from the perspective of Maggie McNamara's character, she really is a modern woman by 1950 standards and by the standards of today. She openly says, are you trying to seduce me? I would just like to know ahead of time. I trust men when they say that they aren't. And I just go along with it. She's open to really anything. She has a great line where she says, don't you think a girl should be preoccupied with sex than occupied? That says so much about the double standards that women have to deal with in general with regards to sex and sexuality. And we're talking about it in 1953. What I noticed in this go round and rewatching it this time is how confused the Bill Holden character is. And I think a lot of that has to play into the persona of Bill Holden. Bill Holden, by 1953, which, by the way, this is three years after Sunset Boulevard, he had been trying to break out of the Smiling Jim characters for years. He does Sunset Boulevard. It changes the trajectory of his career. And then he does this film where he is completely adrift. He's not the guy that's in charge of the sexual interplay between him and Patty. He's very confused. He's never seen a woman who is so openly frank about all of his shtick in terms of seducing a woman. I appreciate that. To see a guy who is the epitome of sophistication and sexuality and romanticism be completely kowtowed by this very small, short, young woman is really refreshing. And it's what helps keep the movie as fresh as it is today as it probably was in 1953. I definitely got that feeling from both William Holden's character and David Niven's character. The vibe that I get from them both is just that they're so stunned by her because she's so refreshing. It's really interesting. I literally turned to my fiance when we were watching this and I said, I think that it's her innocence and her frankness and honesty that keeps her safe in this situation. The fact that she's willing to come out and say these things and be honest with her intentions and hope that these men are going to be honest in their intentions in return. It's something they've never seen before that they just don't know what to do with. So they're not going to do anything to her at the end of the day. (laughs) That's really interesting to watch. It's definitely not a dynamic that you see very often in classic film. Maggie McNamara had appeared in the Chicago production of the play and very briefly had been in the New York run. It's worth pointing out, Otto Preminger staged this film in 1951. It's based on a play by F.U. Herbert at the Henry Miller Theater, originally with Barbara Bel Geddes in the role. And it had a really successful run starting in 1951, which was the worst year on record for the Broadway stage until 1953. Then they did a touring company through the West Coast, which David Niven was in, alongside Diana Lynn, but Maggie McNair was the last person cast. It's really bittersweet to watch how fantastic she is and how she dominates the screen. And yet this was 
something where she didn't really get a ton of credits after this. I think most people may recognize her from something like Three Coins in the Fountain. There's really little known about her other than she was born Marguerite McNamara. She was a John Robert Powers model, and she really didn't care for modeling, very similar to her Patty character. She was just 23 when she made this movie, which holding your own at 23 opposite Bill Holden and David Niven, like, holy crap. I almost started thinking, I don't know if it's because of the look, but she's got this quality that makes me feel like she's a crasser. And I don't use that term in a pejorative way. She's kind of an Audrey Hepburn figure for me in the sense that she's got a very similar look. She's very elegant and prim. It makes me wonder if she got stuck in that typecast. I don't know. Am I completely off base? It's definitely possible. They both have that wayfishness to them. I don't think either one weighed more than 100 pounds during the course of their lives. Yeah, that refinement too. But honestly, I could not see Audrey Hepburn saying half of the things that Maggie McNamara says in this movie. Maggie definitely has that going for her. I was literally going to say, I was thinking about this before we even started recording, that she almost reminds me of a 50s Louise Reiner where she just came on the scene, made a couple really big movies. I mean, she was nominated for Best Actress for this movie, and then she just disappeared into the wind. She has a pretty sad story. She got an Oscar nom for this, a BAFTA nom as well, and then she did Three Coins in the Fountain, did a couple other things. Most people know her from Twilight Zone. She did an episode called The Ring-A-Ding Girl, which is really, really good if you haven't seen it. And then she also did an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. She got married, she divorced David Swift, and then she died in 1978 at the age of 49. She'd supposedly been working as a typist and committed suicide, which is very, very sad. Supposedly there had been a history of mental illness, and there's not really a whole lot known about what had been going on about her life. She had a script that she was interested in, but She's one of those actresses that I'm frustrated there's so many gaps in her life. And I wish that there was more information out there because some of these talents that we see come and go, you want to know what were they thinking? What were they doing? Why did they leave Hollywood? And I think she's definitely one of those actresses who I'm always sad every time I watch this because I'm like, just want to know what happened. Why did things end the way they ended? But she's so good in this. And the fact that she has this movie was her calling card is a huge testament of just how underrated she is especially this one three coins in the fountain is another one i saw so so early on so it's honestly very possible that i saw this movie because of maggie as well i'm not a fan of it (laughs) it makes me want to tear my hair out watching it at least from what i remember it's been quite a long time since i've seen it this movie i just think is so revolutionary especially her character she's just so dynamic And I can't even say that she snaps back because she is really the first one to speak and to dominate the conversation in every single scene. She doesn't even snap back. She's the first one to snap. William Holden and David Niven are just befuddled. They're not thinking straight. I could make some crass comments. They're not thinking with in the right direction. Let's just say that. While they're trying to seduce her, she's the one that's completely in control. She's talking about her career and She tells Bill Holden exactly the type of man that she's looking for. She wants someone older, someone where she can have security, someone that understands her. It's really one of the few times, you see this a lot in Love Triangle films, especially in the classic era. How many times have we said the competition is totally unequal? This guy's got to win. The other guy's got nothing. I'm sorry, Wendell Corey, Ralph Bellamy's of the classic film world. I was literally just about to say <laughs> Ralph Bellamy. Donna Michi got the short of this. Bob Hope yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Guys. But in this film, they're both equally suited to her in some way. And it's really funny to find out that Preminger cast David Niven, despite the studio, they did not want him. They thought that David Niven was passe and that his career was done. Preminger got complete control through United Artists to make this movie. He deferred his producers and directing salaries in exchange for 75% of the film's profits, which, ooh, considering the issues that came up after this, I don't know if Preminger made the right choice. It's one of the few movies where I could really be okay with her ending up with either man. Bill Holden's great. 
But David Niven, considering he's supposed to be older, and I don't even know if him and Bill Holden had a significant age difference, they could have been the same age as far as I'm concerned. I had such a problem with that. I just want to get this out of the way really quick because it's been such a long time since I'd seen this movie. I had totally forgotten about Cynthia as a character, really. When I saw that the second they revealed that David Niven is Cynthia's father, I'm like, what? That makes zero sense. I literally had to Google it. He's 20 years older than her, which I guess is technically possible, but I do not buy it for a second. I don't really either, because aside from the accent, they both seem financially well-suited. They both live in the same building. They both know what they want. They're both older men than her, so that helps in the fact that you're rooting for both of them equally but yeah there's really no significant distinction between the two of them if anything i think bill holden's character is more overtly sexual to patty than niven is he is more interested in getting to know her on the psychological level there's more talking between the two of them although i noticed it this time around i don't know maybe it's a freudian thing but The relationship between him and Patty in this is a lot of him talking about his relationship with Cynthia, his daughter, played by Don Adams. And it's almost like Patty is meant to be a Cynthia stand-in, albeit one that he can marry. It was a little creepy in that regard, just because... I also thought that it was creepy on the other side, too, the way that Cynthia stared them down as they were making out. (laughs) So I think you might be onto something. (laughs) It's a very, very weirdly Freudian film. This movie is significant for what went on with the MPAA. Play was submitted to the MPAA for approval by Paramount in 51. At that time, Joseph Breen sent a letter back saying that the script was unacceptable under the production code. Breen contacted Herbert and advised him that the screenplay was in violation of the production code because, quote, of its light and gay treatment of the subject of illicit sex and seduction. So Preminger submitted a revised draft of the script, which had numerous lines of dialogue that, quote, exhibited an unacceptably light attitude towards seduction, illicit sex, chastity, and virginity. So that was rejected. A lot of people say that this movie was the first to use the word virgin, mistress, and pregnant, which were all in the original play's dialogue. But those weren't really the lines that Breen had an objection to. It was more just the frank discussion of sex and the fact that the characters all know they're going to sleep together at some point, that they want to. Preminger and Herbert advised the Breen office that they didn't agree with them and that they were going to film it without any changes. That is where the code starts to fall apart. So United Artists amended their contract and deleted the clause that required Preminger to deliver a film that would be granted a production code seal of approval, which allowed it to be exhibited. And that was your MPAA rating at the time. So they filmed an English language version as well as a German version, which that apparently is uh, something that I would love to see what a German version of this looks like. And apparently Preminger liked the German version because he didn't think that the psychology of the plot worked in English. After they filmed it, Breen notified Preminger that the film wasn't going to be approved. The director decided to appeal the decision It didn't work in his favor, but they decided to release it without that PCA seal, which made it the first American film to do so in major urban markets. They figured the rural areas probably wouldn't book the film. If you enjoy the podcast, consider supporting us on our Patreon, like David Floyd, Amy Hart, Jeffrey, Brittany Brock, and Elizabeth Ziegler. Our Patreon helps pay the bills, and our patrons get access to a wealth of exclusive content like our classic actress March Madness tournament, bonus series like Doubled Features, based on a true podcast, and Being Elvis, as well as patron bonus swag like our But Have You Read the Book tote bags. Patrons also get monthly video updates from us. Patronage starts at just a dollar a month and gives you the opportunity to start listening to episodes like this 48 hours early. Head over to patreon.com slash ticklishbiz to learn more. The film premiered for an quote-unquote adults-only audience, which that means something far different in 53 than it means to audiences now. Three major nationwide theater chains were willing to exhibit it. It was in the top five box office successes of that week. It did rank number 15 at the box office with a gross of $3.5 million. It was banned in Jersey City, New Jersey as indecent and obscene, and many theaters in small-town USA restricted audiences to men or women separate. That's right. You could not go see this with your partner 
based on gender, you had to decide which screening you were going to go to. Kansas, Ohio, Maryland also banned the film. Preminger and UA decided to actually sue the state of Maryland. What's fascinating to me about this movie, and I'm shocked that, spoiler alert, this is not available on DVD, is that it is such an integral piece of film history. They decided to release this without the seal. It showed that a movie could still make money, and you didn't need Joseph Breen and the Catholic Legion of Decency and all these other people to tell you that your movie was wholesome for them. Yeah, just the history behind it is what makes it so significant to me. It almost goes without saying that it's ahead of its time, but it really is. Not only these lines about sex and gender roles, but also just the humor too. The humor has aged very well. I was literally laughing out loud at some of the scenes. Which you wouldn't know that based on how the trailer markets this movie. I'm assuming it's because they knew that the plot was already being objected to by the Green Council. So if you watch the trailer, it's literally a woman going to buy a ticket and asking what the movie is about. She's being drowned out by all the laughter from the laugh riot of the film that she's going to see. She goes in and they show the ending of the movie. It literally is the end scene with the end. So she comes into the end of the film. She didn't even watch the movie. I guess they're going to reshow it. And she sits down and there is a black bear sitting in the seat next to her eating popcorn. Not a man in a bear suit, a literal bear eating popcorn. And she says to the guy sitting next to the bear, you can't bring a bear in here. And he says, but he loved the play. Then Bill Holden narrates the plot of this movie and why you should go see it. What? It doesn't tell me anything about the plot. They do include the whole preoccupied with sex scene, but that's about it. It is the weirdest way to market your movie with a bear. There was no need for a bear. There was no need for a bear. I don't understand it. It's definitely one of those films that really is a testament to how the production code by the 1950s was really looking so passe. And to watch the movie, Patty as a character... It's very unlike your Donna Reeds and your Doris Days. No disrespect to Doris Day. You look at someone like Doris Day, yeah, who was in the 1950s considered this example of chastity and the hardworking woman and the woman that any man would want to marry. Debbie Reynolds, very sweet, very cute. And Debbie could be sexy, but her movies never emphasized her as a sexual being. She maybe put that out. And that was usually seen as something comical, right? Like, guys were like, oh, Debbie, you're such a little scamp. The scene where she's being thrown around like a football, I feel like that is inherently sexual, but you don't think of her as a sexual object in any of her movies. Not at all. Whereas Patty is very similar to a Debbie Reynolds. She's not a glamazon. She's not Rita Hayward. She's not a woman asking for sex based on how she looks. The audience cannot judge her in that way. But she is a woman that is clearly interested in sex. She is invested in it. And what is fascinating is that most movies, classic film and and even contemporary film, there's this asexuality until a sex scene is involved. So like a character you just assume is not a virgin in most of these movies. You watch a movie with any actress and you're like, that character has probably had sex, unless stating otherwise. But Patty's character is a woman that wears her virginity on her sleeve in a very positive way. Her whole thing is, I'm not willing to give it up till I meet the right person. And the guy I give it to must be worthy of me. That's what I really appreciate. The concept like high value man, as we see nowadays, that's what she's looking for. She is a high value woman and she wants a high value man who can rise to her level, not the other way around. Which again, very un- like most of the women of the 1950s, who were presented as literally exhibiting all of the things that women had to do. They had to be able to have children and keep clean house, cook and entertain, dress to the nines. Patty's whole thing is like, what's a guy doing for me that's like that? Why do I have to deal with this? It should be the other way around. Another thing that really interested me and impressed me when I was watching this related to that is the line where she says... I'm not going to just give it up, but I'm also not going to fight you off because that's vulgar. 
that is what separates her from Doris Day because a movie like Pillow Talk is just her fighting off Rock Hudson. As Alicia Malone said in her intro to That Touch of Mink, her grunts, her hoops. The whole time you're seeing those types of figures on screen in this kind of era. And she is definitely not like that. She's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to do that because that's vulgar. This is what we're actually going to do. She totally sets the scene and sets the tone. Well, what she's also saying, too, that is really impressive is I'm not going to just have sex willy nilly, but... If you make a good argument, I might consider it. And she loses nothing. You don't judge her as any of the words that we would associate with a woman that is considered having casual sex. Don't judge her for that. It's like, okay, if she decides to sleep with Bill Holden or David Niven, I understand that. And she does not lose an ounce of femininity, an ounce of empowerment for any of that. Considering what a horrible human being Otto Preminger was to people, especially Dorothy Dandridge, it's ironic how progressive this film is and how well it works under his direction for better or worse as he is personality wise one of my favorite directors especially the way that he directs william holden i mean he directed him in style 17 also which is considered one of his best what's frustrating is this film was preserved by the academy in 2006 yet i just don't really see the appreciation for it It's not considered this landmark historical film for what it did. I don't really know if because it was released by UA, which was a smaller studio, because it had a harder time getting released because it didn't have the PCA approval. I don't know. Why do you think this movie is not better known? It's what you were alluding to in the beginning. It's just not restored and released in any form of DVD or Blu-ray. I think it's the distribution that's the issue. Right now it's available on YouTube. That's where I watched it. Also some sites that some of us know about. It's not a good print, which is so frustrating. As we've talked about this whole time, how historically significant this movie is and how interesting it is just to look at as like a case study of humans in the 1950s. This movie lifts back the veil of This is what women really thought about. This is what women really cared about. She's being so open and honest with her thoughts and feelings and not just trying to save face for a man. Regardless of its historical significance as a movie outside of the plot, even the plot is just so crazy to look at and so crazy to watch. And so is their acting performances. We just need a decent print. I want to track down who owns this and just shake them a little bit. We got this done for History is Made at Night, okay? I don't know who owns the UA archive. That would be interesting to find out. I want to say they went to MGM, but yeah. Which now, yeah, MGM, depending on the year, is now owned by Warners, but then it can also be owned by Amazon. I have to do some digging into that. But no, it looks like on Amazon you can buy a foreign import for about 30 bucks. You can buy a Laserdisc version if you would like one. It's ridiculous that it's not had any significant restoration, considering its stars. I mean, just bare minimum, Preminger, Holden, I was just about to say, Preminger and Holden alone, and Niven for that matter, absolutely. But then Preminger is usually a guy, his version of Porgy and Bess will probably never see the light of day, based on rights issues, unfortunately. So he tends to be a director that apparently enjoys giving modern day audiences a challenge. I do want to point out that there are some side characters that are emphasized in the trailers being part of this movie, especially Gregory Radoff, who is only in it for one scene in a cab. That is about it. This is an example of a movie that maybe doesn't have a ton of narrative weight to it, but to look at where the trajectory of film would go in its wake is what makes it significant. I'm sure Otto Preminger made a movie that would entertain. Is it the best movie of the 1950s? No, not at all. But considering what it did for the rating system, it makes it a worthy historical something that we should be concerned with preserving. Another thing too, I hate to go off on a tangent here, but another thing that fascinates me about this movie too is that I'd say like 80 to 90% of it happens in real time, which really fascinated me. 
And I think that's another thing that stands out in his work or the work of something like Hitchcock. This makes me almost think of a movie like Rope, but like it's not quite the same. It all takes place in one building in real time. So that gives me those mirrors. You're talking about the side characters. I keep thinking of Cynthia. She's just such a stalker. You think Dawn is a stalker? Cynthia is the real stalker of this movie. (laughs) Because she spends the entire time, somehow she's in this building. I guess because she lives with her dad, but she's still just creeping on this man after they've broken up. Just literally peering behind curtains and going out in the rain and... She is a piece of work and she definitely stands out because of just how much she just appears silently. She doesn't even have more than five lines of dialogue either. Poor Dawn Adams has a very limited role in this. According to the internet, Amazon might own this as part of their MGM deal. Might be one of the few things they kept, but I'm unclear because I know that from a certain year, the archive is owned by Warner's. I also want to point out that this movie utilizes the Empire State Building before Sleepless in Seattle did it, most famously. I thought of that, too. (laughs) I was like, oh my gosh, where are the Sleepless in Seattle fans? And the Love Affair fans, too. A Fair to Remember. Yeah, A Fair to Remember, yeah. Even something like On the Town. Yeah, I feel like this should be included in those conversations. To go back to Bill Holden really briefly, to look at what he was doing in the 1950s, where he was always the guy that was in control of the relationship. Born Yesterday, another great 1950s gem. He's the one educating Billy Dawn, which is great. I love that movie, and he's great in it. But to see little Maggie McNamara just flummox him, he says throughout the movie so many times how weird she is. She's like, yeah, but are you not into it? He's like, I don't genuinely know. He doesn't really know. He knows he's not opposed to her. It does make me wonder how their relationship would have gone. Do you see Dawn and Patty withstanding the test of time? Dinner parties with the dad are going to be a little weird from now on. I was going (laughs) to say- That's the hurdle they have to overcome. Because I feel like he's still very much in the picture somehow. I don't think they really successfully got rid of him. I could see them being a Hollywood thruple. I could see that happening. Yeah, I honestly want some kind of design for living situation. Yeah, some sort of brother-husband type of relationship going on there. As long as no muffin pans are involved. (laughs) (laughs) That's the one element that brings a bit false in this movie is that Patty's character is really there to remind him he should just be a better dad to his kid. And I'm like, no, no. He's that dad that's definitely going to hit on Cynthia's friends forever and always. There's no way around that. It's so funny that you say that because she even has a line in the movie. He has a chance to be a really good father. It's like, yeah, you should be a really good father to the child that you already have. (laughs) And also, if you're in a relationship with a man who's looking for a daughter, you should probably run. It's just not going to work out. (laughs) I wish this movie was available, much like Veronica Lake's filmography, which we talked about, just the lack of access to it. That's another reason it's just not been given its due, is the lack of a restoration and the lack of distribution for it. It's frustrating that United Artists took a gamble on it in 1953 and put it out without that production seal, and now whoever owns it just decides to let it sit in a vault somewhere. So I'm manifesting this. I want this out on a proper DVD or shown at a TCM Fest or something so that it can get the love that it deserves. I am so in agreement. It's just such a gem. And I can't even say that it's a product of its time. It's just a weird outlier of its time. But that's why it's so great to look at. This would be so fun at the Fest. All the William Holden fans would gather people would just get such a crazy kick out of the dialogue of this movie. Modern audiences, you guys need to watch this. If you haven't watched this, watch it. This is one of the ones. Do we recommend it? Yeah, you need to see this at least once. I can't believe it hasn't been shown at TCM, especially this year. It's its anniversary year. 70th anniversary. I'm going to sound like a broken record by the end of this, but it's just so unique and fun. And it talks so openly about subjects that you're not going to find in any other movie. And there are so many robes. So many. The amount of robe work in this. And there's a pretty 
shocking by 1950 standards scene where she's changing clothes and people walk in and she's clearly in undergarments night nurse type For of sure. vibes absolutely yeah. uh, like hey francis and oh like yes yes love it love maggie mcnamara wish this movie was on dvd people should go see it anything else we want to add before we close it out just that william holden is gorgeous i wish that he wore glasses in all of his movies like he did in born yesterday yes. i'm very disappointed <laughs> by the fact that he doesn't i just put glasses on him in my head whenever i watch anything else you can let us know your thoughts on The Moon is Blue, the production code. Who owns the United Artist Archive? You can email that to us, tweet us, contact us, however you do that. That closes out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter. We have not had one in 2023, and it would be great to get a new one. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, five stars. You can follow us on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at TicklishBiz. You can follow me over at therap.com, as well as on Twitter at my new handle. I finally changed it now that the blue checks are gone. At KristenLopez88. I'm also on Instagram at, at KristenLopez88. Samantha Ellis, where are you? You can mostly follow me on Twitter at Classic Film Geek, but you can find my blog at musingsofclassicfilmatic.com and my Cooking with the Stars posts over at classicmoviehub.com. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us a chance to do new content like our March Madness bracket, as well as do our TCM Film Festival audio. So consider helping us at patreon.com slash Ticklish Biz. And of course, my book, But Have You Read the Book, is already out. You can order it wherever you buy books. We will return with a new episode on May 24th. Till then. <laughs>